Homeostasis is the maintenance of a stable internal environment, keeping variables within narrow limits despite external changes. In humans, key homeostatic variables include body temperature, which is maintained around 37 degrees Celsius, blood pH, kept at about 7.4, blood glucose concentration, about 4 to 6 millimoles per liter, and blood osmotic concentration, linked to solute levels in sodium. When these variables fluctuate too far from their set points, our bodies initiate responses to bring them back into balance. Our bodies do this by using negative feedback. Negative feedback is a control mechanism where a change in a variable triggers a response that counteracts the change. In other words, negative feedback will help return values to the original state and promote stability. Think of homeostasis as this balance. The human body should be maintained at about 37 degrees Celsius. This is the balanced state. However, if the body temperature becomes imbalanced or moves below the optimal range, a series of steps will occur to correct the imbalance. First, a receptor detects a change in a specific internal condition, called a stimulus. For example, thermoreceptors in the skin detect a drop in temperature. The control center receives input from the receptor and processes the information. In the case of temperature regulation, the hypothalamus in the brain acts as the control center. It compares the current temperature to the normal set point and decides on an appropriate response. The effector carries out the response directed by the control center to restore balance. For example, muscles may begin to shiver to generate heat, or blood vessels may constrict to reduce heat loss. The response of the effector reduces or reverses the original stimulus, bringing the internal condition back toward the set point. Once balance is restored, the response is reduced or stopped, completing the negative feedback loop. On the other hand, positive feedback works to amplify or promote change. Positive feedback loops are not used to maintain homeostasis, but can be useful in certain circumstances, such as childbirth or fruit ripening. Maintaining homeostasis allows the body to keep internal conditions within narrow limits, even when the external environment changes. This is essential for enzyme activity and cellular function and allows organisms to adapt to diverse environments. The regulation of blood glucose is a key example of how hormones maintain homeostasis in the human body. Two hormones, insulin and glucagon, are secreted by endocrine cells in the pancreas. Insulin is released by beta cells in the pancreas, while glucagon is released by alpha cells. Let's take a deeper look at what each of these hormones does. When blood glucose levels rise after eating, beta cells detect the increase and secrete insulin into the bloodstream. Insulin binds to the insulin receptors on body cells, triggering the uptake of glucose through glucose transporters like GLUT4. Recall glucose is a hydrophilic molecule and cannot pass through the hydrophobic lipid bilayer of the cell membrane by simple diffusion. GLUT4 is a carrier protein embedded in the membrane that enables glucose to enter the cell via facilitated diffusion. This process does not rely on ATP, but on the concentration gradient of glucose, which moves from high to low concentration. Insulin travels through the blood and binds to receptors on liver, muscle, and adipose or fat cells, triggering glucose uptake for use in cellular respiration and promoting the conversion of glucose into glycogen for storage. This lowers blood glucose back to its set point. Conversely, when blood glucose levels fall, such as during exercise or fasting, alpha cells release glucagon. Glucagon circulates in the blood and acts primarily on the liver, stimulating the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. This is then released into the bloodstream to raise blood sugar levels. These hormonal responses operate through a negative feedback loop, ensuring that blood glucose levels remain within a narrow, healthy range essential for cellular function and overall metabolic stability. What happens when the body fails to properly regulate blood glucose levels? You might be familiar with diabetes. Diabetes is a disease in which the body fails to regulate blood glucose effectively, leading to chronically elevated blood glucose levels. In a healthy body, when blood glucose levels rise, insulin binds to insulin receptors on body cells, triggering the uptake of glucose through glucose transporters like GLUT4. However, in people with diabetes, either insulin production is impaired, as in type 1, or the body cells become resistant to insulin's effects, as in type 2, leading to poor glucose regulation. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes each have distinct physiological characteristics. In type 1 diabetes, the immune system destroys the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas, resulting in little or no insulin production. A lack of insulin prevents body cells from taking up glucose. If there are low insulin levels, there will be less insulin binding to insulin receptors, which means less GLUT4 proteins being activated to allow for the passage of glucose into the cells. This is problematic because glucose is required for cellular respiration and production of ATP. This condition usually develops in childhood and requires insulin injections for treatment. In contrast, type 2 diabetes typically occurs in adults and is caused by insulin resistance, where body cells can no longer respond properly to insulin. 
Again, if insulin receptors are not activated, the signal transduction pathway is not activated, meaning GLUT4 does not allow glucose to enter the cells. This can occur in a number of ways, but in general, the insulin receptors on the cells are no longer responsive. Over time, the pancreas may also produce less insulin. Major risk factors for type 2 diabetes include obesity, lack of physical activity, poor diet, and genetic predisposition. Type 2 diabetes can often be treated with lifestyle changes such as a healthy diet, regular exercise, and weight control, along with medication if needed. Thermoregulation is another key example of negative feedback control in homeostasis, allowing the body to maintain a stable internal temperature despite changes in the external environment. One key way the body maintains its temperature is with the hormone thyroxin. Thyroxin increases the rate of cellular respiration in most body cells, which leads to greater heat production. In the context of thermoregulation, thyroxin helps raise body temperature by boosting overall metabolism, especially when the body is too cold. Here is the sequence of steps that occur. When body temperature drops from the set point around 37 degrees Celsius, peripheral thermoreceptors in the skin detect the change and send signals to the hypothalamus, the brain's temperature regulating center. The hypothalamus processes this information and coordinates a response involving the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland will release TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which then stimulates the thyroid gland to release thyroxin. As mentioned before, thyroxin increases the metabolic rate of cells, generating more heat throughout the body. As body temperature rises, the response is reduced and the negative feedback loop is complete. There are four additional mechanisms you are expected to know and understand involved in body temperature regulation. If the body drops below the set point, in addition to stimulating release of thyroxin, the hypothalamus activates effectors. These include skeletal muscles, which can cause shivering to generate heat, which I'm sure you have experienced at some point in your life. Next, brown adipose tissue or fat plays an important role in producing heat through a process called uncoupled respiration. Uncoupled respiration is a form of respiration that produces heat rather than ATP. Brown adipose tissue plays an especially important role in thermoregulation of animals that hibernate, such as grizzly bears, and infants who tend to lose heat quickly because of their large surface area relative to their body mass. In addition, hair erection can occur which is when tiny muscles at the base of hair follicles contract and cause body hairs to stand up. While this has little effect in humans, in other mammals, it traps a layer of insulating air close to the skin, causing a warming effect. Lastly, vasoconstriction can occur. This is when blood vessels near the surface of the skin narrow, reducing blood flow to the skin. This minimizes heat loss to the environment by keeping warm blood deeper in the body. We've looked at how the body can raise its temperature, but what about when the body overheats and body temperature rises above the set point? If the body temperature rises above the set point, negative feedback mechanisms will help cool down and restore thermal balance. Again, peripheral thermoreceptors are responsible for detecting changes in the body surface temperature. These signals are relayed to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then coordinates several responses. First, vasodilation can occur. Blood vessels near the skin surface widen, increasing blood flow to the skin. This allows more heat to be lost at the skin's surface. Next, sweat glands are activated to release moisture from the skin. As the sweat evaporates, it removes heat from the body, producing a cooling effect. Why is sweating so effective at cooling the body? Consider the properties of water. The heat of evaporation is the amount of energy required to change a substance from liquid to gas without changing its temperature. For water, this value is very high, meaning it takes a lot of energy to turn liquid sweat into vapor. Therefore, every drop of sweat removes a large amount of heat as it evaporates, making sweating an especially powerful cooling process. In addition, it's important to remember that you can also make conscious choices to respond to changes in your body temperature. For example, if you are feeling cold, you might choose to put on a sweater or an extra layer of clothing. If you are feeling hot, you might seek shade, remove layers of clothing, or drink cold fluids. Regardless of the response, once the core body temperature returns to the set point, the responses will be reduced and the negative feedback loop is complete. 